Well, it's a great pleasure to have Gerald Dunn uh, in for this week's seminar. Uh, Gerald is visiting from Connecticut and he is well known to, to most of us. I, I, I won't go and belabor the introductions, but he's going to tell us about uh, resurgence, phase transitions and extrapolation. And we're certainly looking forward to hearing that. Thank you, Danja. It's a pleasure to almost be in Dublin, at least virtually. Uh, as you mentioned, I'll have to make it a real visit sometime. So I want to talk about resurgence today. So it's a long title, three topics. I may not get to much of the extrapolation story, um, but I'd prefer to give you the idea of what resurgence is and how it can be related and used for studying phase transitions. Um, feel free to ask questions during, and uh, we have time afterwards, I assume, for further questions. So. So start with some big picture motivations, some really hard questions. The goal here is to look for some non-perturbative definition of quantum field theory, complementary to what we have with lattice gauge theory, because lattice gauge theory is very good for some things, but not for others. For example, the question of Minkowski versus Euclidean quantum field theory is extremely hard to probe using lattice techniques, as is the sign problem for finite density quantum field theory, as are real-time problems like fully dynamical and non-equilibrium problems. And then there are the questions of how do you probe phase transitions in some complicated gauge theory like QCD, for example, or even in some statistical field theories. And the common thread here is that I want to focus on is what does it mean, and is it even a sensible question to talk about analytic continuation of path integrals? So that's my background motivation. And of course, I haven't solved this problem in full detail for quantum field theory, but there's been remarkable progress using this insight coming from the mathematical theory of resurgence in recent years. So my two questions for today are, I first have to tell you a little bit about what resurgence is. And then with the physicist's eye on this, we have this skeptical question, is it actually genuinely new and useful or not? And the second part of the talk is really, can you use these ideas of resurgence to somehow decode information in a really difficult problem where basically the only approach we have is some finite order of perturbation theory, for example. That, uh, that is clearly the situation in many complicated problems of interest. So to be a little bit more focused, you know, the physics is, this is the, the real path integral, the Minkowski path integral, but we often make these formal uh, WIC rotations and deal with this either analytically or in uh, lattice simulations in Monte Carlo. And the real question is how justified is this and what do you do in the situations where under this wick rotation S is still not real? For example, what happens in finite density problems where S is still imaginary, sorry, not imaginary, complex, which makes the Monte Carlo definite uh, interpretation of this formula problematic. So we can go back to the very old work of uh, Airy and company studying rainbows. And I just want to bring to light this paradigm problem. Here's the integral representation of the Airy function. We all know this very well. And I want to stress that to evaluate this integral, even this simple one dimensional integral, requires some insight from complex analysis. And the famous thing, of course, about the Airy function is that when the variable x is positive, there's an exponential decay behavior, but when x is negative, there's an oscillatory behavior. And this is well known, of course, from optics and in quantum mechanics, but this has some important lessons because if you think of this as a baby version of a Minkowski path integral, and you would just to make some formal uh, wick rotation analytic continuation, you would not see this structure at all. 
for example, and it, if you tried to evaluate this thing numerically, it's a completely hopeless task. This is a plot of the real part of the integrand as a function of t. And you see just from looking at that, that it's an absolutely hopeless problem. You cannot possibly evaluate that integral numerically. For example, when x is about five, you know, somewhere here, and you try to evaluate this, there have to be massive cancellations to get the answer of the order 10 to the minus four. So it's clearly a completely hopeless task to try and discretize this in any way and calculate an integral like this numerically. Of course, we all know the answer. The answer is that we can employ a contour deformation and complex analysis and interpret the behavior of this in terms of the saddles and the great discovery of uh, Airy and Stokes was that on this side, when X is positive, the integral is dominated by one saddle point. But when X is negative, the integral is dominated by two saddle points leading to the oscillatory behavior. And as X crosses from positive to negative, there's a genuine phase transition called a Stokes transition, where the chain, there's a change of dominant saddle and that completely changes the behavior of this, let's call it a partition function or path integral, this simple one dimensional integral. Okay, so this I think is a familiar example to physicists from optics or quantum mechanics. And I want to build on these ideas uh, up to the level of doing this in infinite dimensions or path integrals. So here's a more precise version of the question. Can we make sense physically, mathematically, and also computationally of what's called a left, left shed thimble expansion of a path integral? Left shed thimble is just a fancy word for infinite dimensional saddles. So imagine we have this formal path integral that we want to make sense of somehow in some integral over field, some infinite dimensional uh, integration measure here, and there's some action, and there really is an I here. So does it make sense to look for saddle points of this, so solutions of the uh, first variation, and to actually decompose this into a sum over those saddles, and now remember your complex analysis that the definition, once you've found the saddles, you deform the contours to go through the saddle points on steepest descent contours, which brings the integral and the control mathematically. And then the task is to break up your original uh, contour of integration into a sum of these steepest descent contours, which would be this sum over thimbles, and now the great thing about a steepest descent contour is that the definition of a steepest descent contour is that the imaginary part of the thing in the exponent is fixed, is constant. That's the definition from the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So there's just a phase factor which is constant, can be taken outside of the integration. And what's left is the real part of the exponent, which is perfectly well behaved and actually behaves like a nice regularized uh, Gaussian integral along this functional steepest descent contour. There is a Jacobian factor that you have to worry about. And there is a question that as you change the parameters, certain steepest descent contours turn on and off in the sense that they contribute or not to the integral. Just think back to this area integral. As you change this parameter, think of that parameter as something like a chemical potential or a coupling. As you change it, from some value to another value, the dominating saddles change. So we should at least expect behavior like that to be happening in a um, infinite dimensional version thereof. So the real question is, does it, a formula like this make any sense whatsoever? And I really want to emphasize that by making sense, I mean not just at a formal level, actually at a computational level. And there's been remarkable progress in the last couple of years in actually implementing these ideas in the context of lattice gauge theory, which I'll briefly mention later. Now the story is even more complicated than that because the, in the area integral, of course, there's only one parameter, x. The area function is just a function of x. But of course, in real problems, we've got some coupling, but we've also got mass parameters, couplings, chemical potential, temperature, external magnetic field. There are all sorts of parameters that can vary 
that will change the saddle point structure and will affect the interpretation of this formula. However, I would argue that given that this is what physics is, and this is what we actually want to calculate, that it's at least a reasonable question to explore problems like this at the level of Python tools to see if there's a way to formalize the um, concept of an infinite dimensional steepest descent contour in configuration space. So that's my motivation. And now what does that have to do with uh, resurgence? So I have to tell you a little bit about resurgence. And one of the ideas is going to be is that as you go through one of these Stokes transitions by changing one of these parameters, the structure of this type of expansion can change dramatically. Again, keep in the back of your mind this area example where it can be an expansion involving decaying exponentials or oscillatory exponentials. So what is resurgence? Um, the name comes from some work by a pure mathematician, Jean Eccal, from the 19, early 1980s. Some of the key ideas actually are in Dingle's beautiful book on uh, asymptotics. And the real ideas go back to Stokes from the mid 1800s. Um, some sort of uh, summaries of what it means for physics. At one level, resurgence is a unification of perturbation theory and non-perturbative physics. So I'll give you some examples that hopefully will clarify that. At a mathematical level, the motivation of people like A. Carl and uh, associated mathematicians is that it's a way of doing global complex analysis, not just for analytic function, but what are called analyzable functions, which include at functions defined through asymptotic series. So all the questions you're used to asking about the complex analysis, like monodromy, um, can you, how can you actually do that when what you're dealing with is a function that's just uh, defined through an asymptotic series, not through some nice analytic function. So the first step on this route is, is to replace a formal perturbative series, which in physics applications is very often asymptotic, divergent and asymptotic, not always, but very often, to generalize this expansion into something called a trans series. And the concept is very deep, and I'm just going to give an in a version of it uh, in physics applications, that a Taylor series would just be an expansion in powers of G squared, some coupling and some coefficients. So that would be um, the beginnings of possibly asymptotic expansion. The idea is that this thing is not well behaved than the analytic continuation in the parameter G squared. But if you include these non-perturbative exponential factors and also powers of logarithms, then it's possible that this thing is actually constructible in such a way that it is well-defined under analytic continuation. Now, how is that possible? How it's possible is that if you just have this portion of information about the function, and if it's an asymptotic series, then you don't really know what's happening as you rotate in the complex plane in the coupling with respect to these Stokes transitions. You don't know when these exponentially small quantities are going to kick in. However, if you build one object that includes these exponential factors, and also it turns out you need these logarithm uh, powers, then it's a triple expansion. And these coefficients um, encode the information of when these Stokes transitions occur. And what that means, for that to work, the only way that can possibly work is that the expansion coefficients, say, in the perturbative direction and the expansion coefficients in the instanton directions have to be correlated with one another. And I'll give you some explicit examples of how that works. But that's the underlying lesson, that it's possible to replace what we would get as output from a physics problem that is perturbation theory. And it's possible to enlarge the scope of this in such a way that you can build something that really is the function. And I, ha I have to justify that by some examples. 
The result of Ekal is actually coming from a very different direction. He was working on dynamical systems, trying to address one of the uh, Hilbert problems. And he noticed that if you use these basic building blocks of powers of a parameter, these exponential factors, and these powers of logarithms, and you allow for iterations, so you allow for exponentials of exponentials and logs of logs of logs, that's a full-blown trans series. And it turns out that that object is well-defined under essentially all mathematical oper operations. It forms a closed mathematical system. And that's the big theorem of Eccal. And that seems to be the underlying reason why this trans series concept is so important and so adaptable. So it's mainly been developed in differential equations, both ODEs and PDUs, linear and nonlinear, difference equations, fluid mechanics. And it's beginning to be applied in, in physics, in starting quantum mechanics, but also matrix models, field theory, particularly Chen Simons theory and string theory. And I'll give you a few examples as we go along. So let me give you an example of this idea of becoming well-defined on an analytic continuation. So this is a very simple example we should all be familiar with, the Stirling expansion of the gamma function. So I'll write it in terms of the psi function, the derivative of the log of the gamma function, so we can talk about sums instead of products. And here is the large Z expansion of the uh, psi function, the digamma function. And the first two terms are what we usually call the Stirling expansion but it's easy to generate all these terms. And if you calculate the first few, you might delude yourself into thinking that this is a convergent expansion, but it's an extremely divergent expansion. These coefficients are in fact Bernoulli numbers, which diverge like to n factorial at high order. So this is a very beautiful example of an asymptotic series. Now, we know a few things about the gamma function. We know that there's a functional relation that x gamma of x is gamma of x plus one. And if you translate that into the psi function, there's this so-called functional relation. And this expansion here is consistent with this functional relation. In fact, it's a way of generating the, the series. However, we know that the gamma function can be analytically continued in the complex plane just with uh, poles along the negative integers in zero. And that's encoded in something called the reflection formula, which if I write it in terms of the psi function, looks like this. So this is a property of the, this is a sort of global property of this function. But if we look at this formula, and you imagine trying to take Z to the imaginary axis, all of these terms here are in even powers of Z. So the only imaginary part you would pick up comes from these two terms, which translates into the imaginary part being just these two terms, which correspond to this term and the first term in expansion here. And that's simply incorrect. If you just have the black terms, which you would naively get from an analytic continuation of this formal series, it simply doesn't satisfy the global analytic properties of, of the psi function. However, you can fix this in several ways. One is using Borel summation. You can sum this asymptotic series more precisely. And you learn something very interesting, that there's a completely precise series of exponentials. And the coefficients are absolutely fixed. The prefactor is absolutely fixed in such a way that you restore the reflection formula. Okay? So this is a baby version of one of these trans series. You have this asymptotic series, on the face of it, it itself does not have, does not encode the analytic continuation properties that it should. But there's a way to upgrade it to a trans series where you add these exponentially small terms, but now we diverge from the, no pun intended, we diverge from the Poncrave attitude towards asymptotic series that these exponentially small things are unknowable, there really is a completely precise set of exponentially small terms that you can add in such a way to restore at the analytic continuation properties. And that's the sort of idea we would like to be able to implement in, in uh, more formally. Okay, this is a simple example, but it illustrates the point, and this is what we would call non-perturbative completion in physics. <clears throat> 
that given an asymptotic series, can you work out precise information about the instanton contributions, these exponentially small terms. All right, so here's a picture of uh, what a Carl's result tells us. If you go back to this trans series, the only way in which this can work to make this well-behaved and analytic continuation by adding these extra terms here is that these things have to somehow fix what was missing from this, okay? As we just saw in that example. So the only way, if that can happen, that tells you that you can learn something about these from this and vice versa. So that's the idea here, what this picture is supposed to represent, a bunch of critical points or saddle points or locations of, uh, of instanton factors. And the idea is that if you know the fluctuations around one of these things, any one of these saddle points, in principle, it should be possible to reconstruct information about the other saddle points. And in principle, about all of them. Now, I don't know about you, but when I heard that for the first time, I said, no way, that's impossible. That's absurd, um, especially to be able to do that at the level of infinite dimensional integrals. But I'll show you some examples where we really can do this. So one of the tools we'll need along the way is Borel summation. And typically, expansions, perturbative expansion in physics in some coupling, I see I change from G squared to G, sorry. But typically the coefficients grow factorially. You can make a Borel transform where you divide these coefficients by this n factorial growth. This thing then has a finite radius of convergence and you reconstruct the original Borel sum of the original function by doing this Laplace time integral, which term by term just again cancels these n factorials. And the idea of Borel is that if you can now understand the analytic properties of this Borel transform function, which is now a convergent series, you have a hope of being able to reconstruct the, the uh, analytic continuation properties of the original function. And so this is of course an old and very well studied uh, subject. And there are many theorems about when it can work and when it can't work. Unfortunately, they're of limited use in physics because in all the really interesting problems, we have no way of testing whether the thing we're trying to calculate actually satisfies all the fine print of those theorems. So in the spirit of mathematical physics, we can proceed and just try to calculate something. But the important message here is that the singularities of this Borel transform function become the really interesting physical objects because singularities of this will give a pole contribution, which will be an exponential. So starting from a series, which has no exponentials, by constructing the Borel transform and then doing some analytic exploration of the properties of the Borel transform, you can actually detect these exponentially small terms that you should be adding to the original function to make it a trans series. So that, that's the idea. And again, I can only illustrate this with some examples. All right, so there's one very Beautiful, simple example, which um, we should all learn when we're learning uh, undergraduate complex analysis, but somehow we got cheated and we're not taught this, at least I wasn't. Consider some one dimensional contour integral where this function here, think of it as the action, has at least two critical points, two saddle points. And we're interested in the small g limit, so we look for the saddle points of this. and this is the steepest descent contour through the nth saddle point. And so imagine there are lots of these saddle points all over the place. And for each saddle point, you can define a unique steepest descent contour through that saddle point. And that is now a completely well-defined integral. And what we do in physics is we typically say that the dominant contribution is just evaluating the function at the saddle point. And then we do so the first variation is zero, but then there's a, there's a second variation term, which is Gaussian, which leads to some prefactor involving some sort of square root of, of G squared. And that's usually what we take as the sort of semi-classical saddle point approximation to that integral. But of course, that's not the whole story because F is expanded in an infinite Taylor series. 
So the corrections to this you could organize as a, an expansion in G squared. I hope that's clear. So this is all orders beyond the usual Gaussian approximation. So think of this as an expansion in powers of G squared. There are a few indices here. N refers to, we're talking about the specific integral going through the nth saddle point. And R here is referring to the order of the expansion around this leading behavior at that saddle point. Now there's an amazing result, which is just basic complex analysis, but it was really first pointed out explicitly in this beautiful paper by Michael Berry and Chris Howells on another topic, that there's a universal relation between the large order behavior of these coefficients and the coefficients about other saddle points. So there's a lot going on here. So just concentrate for a second. At large order R, these coefficients of the fluctuations around the nth saddle point absolutely generically behave like R factorial. And then there are some corrections to that. There's some coefficient. And then there's another term which is going like R minus two factorial, so slower growth. And then another term that's going like R minus three factorial, et cetera. The interesting thing is that the coefficients of these successive terms involve powers of the difference, capital F is the difference of the action at the nth saddle point relative to the saddle action at the nth saddle point. So this is a sum over all the other saddle points, not the nth one, but all the other ones. And the amazing thing is that the coefficients in this expansion here are the coefficients of the expansion around the nth saddle point. Okay, so this, this is absolutely stunning. We're saying that the large order growth of the coefficients of fluctuations around one of these saddle points are determined in terms of the expansions around the other saddle points. So that's weird, so let's look at a concrete example. Let's go back to Airy again. So the action function is cubic, so there are two saddle points. And it's a simple enough integral. This is, of course, just a simple Bessel function. So we know the expansion coefficients around these two saddle points. They're just given explicitly here. And here are the first few terms. Now we can pick one of the, the plus minus refers to these two saddle points. So let's look at the large order in R behavior at the uh, plus saddle point. So you see there's a R factorial, R factorial, one over R factorial. So the leading growth is indeed R factorial. And you can check, you can write it, it's like this, prefactor. There's a four thirds to the R. And now remember the action at one of these guys is two thirds and the other one is minus two thirds. So that four thirds is exactly, sorry, is exactly this difference of the actions between the two saddles. And now if you write it as R minus one factorial, R minus two factorial, R minus three factorial, the coefficients are exactly the coefficients around the other saddle point, the low orders. It, this is really remarkable. And uh, I still feel cheated that I was not told this when I was learning complex analysis. It's not that difficult. And I urge you to pick your favorite special function and just write down the integral representation. It's completely straightforward to check that this is always true. So and in fact, it, it, yeah. You are, you're pointing out that this result is from 1991. Well, it, I mean. Was it known for the Airy function? It, it was sort of known, but the generality of it was, was really made explicit. Um, I mean, it's buried in the work of Dingle, um, but uh, Berry and Howells really made it very explicit that how, how general this is. It's now been proven completely rigorously that this is a feature of all nonlinear ODEs, PDEs, and difference equations and systems of integral equations. So this is not just this, the, a feature of this uh, um, simple linear problem. And people have discovered this sort of behavior in truly infinite dimensional problems, such as quantum mechanics, matrix models, and field theories, hints of this sort of behavior. 
And I, I maintain that somehow the skeleton of where this is coming from is just this basic example from ordinary uh, one-dimensional quantum intervals. And remember, a lot of the intuition we have about how to make semi-classical expansions in path integrals is built on what we know about one-dimensional uh, integrals, exponential integrals. So let me give you an infinite dimensional example. So I, I see there's no way I'm gonna finish what I'm talking about, but that's, I think that's a good thing. Uh, let's continue to go slowly. So here's a nice example from quantum mechanics, the periodic potential. And for other reasons, I write the energy as U. Uh, now here's a plot of the spectrum as a function of the coupling H bar, like one over H bar is like the coupling. And here's the energy. Here's the top of the potential and the bottom of the potential. It's a cosine potential, so like this. And we know that deep inside the wells of this cosine potential, the spectrum is almost discrete. Right? And it almost looks just like a harmonic oscillator. So the energy as a function of h bar goes like yeah. h bar times n plus a half. So eight, half h bar, three halves h bar, five halves h bar. Okay? But as you increase this h bar, which means you're going closer to the top of the potential, these exponentially narrow bands widen. And eventually they widen so much that you're above the top of the potential and now you're in the regime of narrow gaps. So this should be familiar from solid state physics. And if you want to write an expression for the energy as a function both of the h bar parameter, but also of the, uh, let's call it the level number or the band label number n. So this is the ground state, the zeroth band, the first excited, second excited, third excited, etc. You can comfortably do perturbation theory as a function of small h bar, but you will discover that it's a divergent series. And we all know, I think, from quantum mechanics, just the level of Landau Lifshitz, that the splitting of this level into a narrow band is exponential in minus one of that h bar and has some prefactor stuff. And the plus minus here refers to the top and the bottom of the band. And you know, usually we would take just this factor here as the approximation to the width of the band. But suppose you're interested in the question of varying either h bar or n in such a way that you go from narrow bands to narrow gaps, crossing this thing here, which I claim is a phase transition, meaning that you would want not just the first instant on, but the next exponential and the next and the next. And moreover, each of these exponential factors has a fluctuation around it. Okay, so this is a, an example of this trans series structure that I was mentioning before. That instead of just having an expansion in h bar, we also need to include these exponentially small terms due to this tunneling effect between the different wells of the periodic potential. Okay, so I hope the structure is, is somehow familiar to people. And also that you can evaluate this action factor here by evaluating what's called an instanton tunneling under the barrier from one well to the neighboring one. Okay, so now what has this got to do with resurgence? It turns out, if you think of this as the formal perturbative series, which is divergent, if you believe what I've been telling you about resurgence, the claim is that Okay, we just calculated the fluctuations around the zero instanton sector. And the claim of resurgence is that if you know those fluctuations, you should be able to work out the fluctuations around the one instanton, two instanton, three instanton, four instanton, just from this information, which again, sounds absolutely absurd and in the interests of uh, truth in, uh, in uh, telling the story, we actually set out to disprove this to show that it was not possible. It turns out there's a completely explicit expression for this fluctuation here around the one instant time in terms of this data. And you know this could have been discovered by whoever first wrote, wrote down the Matthew equation. Um, but looking, looking for the relation was not uh, an obvious thing to do. And it turns out that there's this is not just true of this one instanton order, it's true of any instanton order in this expansion. What it means is that 
if you have this information, which is just perturbation theory, which is divergent, I can tell you the complete trans series expansion, which has all of these exponentially small behaviors in it, all of their fluctuations in absolutely closed form. And now that object, which is the full trans series, is able to now cross this phase transition, describing the transition from narrow, exponentially narrow bands to exponentially narrow gaps. And it's really astonishing that the, in all the thousands of papers written about the Matthew equation that this hadn't been noticed before. Now, in terms of phase transitions, let's look at this plot again a little bit more deeply. Remember, these shaded regions are the bands due to the tunneling under the barrier. But as you go above the top of the potential and you go way up here at very high energies, this is you now in the region not of the tight binding model, but of the free electron model in solid state language. And now the spectrum's almost continuous, but with very narrow gaps. And if you look carefully at the transition point, the width of that band, I don't know if you can see my uh, pointer, but the width of that band is equal to the width of that gap. The width of that band is equal to the width of that gap. The width of that band is equal to the width of that gap. There's an actual transition between narrow bands and narrow gaps, which occurs at this Tuft coupling value of eight over pi. And this is like a Tuft coupling of taking h bar to zero n to infinity, but keeping it finite. There's a critical value at which you make this transition. And while I think it's well known that the width of these bands is governed by instantons tunneling between minima of local of neighboring wells, the narrow gaps are actually described by um, instantons between turning points. But now, if the energy is above the potential, the turning points must be in the complex plane. The definition of a turning point is that the energy is equal to the potential, but cosine, of course, is only one if you stay in the, in the, in the uh, real domain. But there are complex turning points, and if you evaluate the action on solutions that go between these complex turning points, that actually gives you the width of these gaps. And uh, the earliest reference I know to that is in the solid state literature of that beautiful paper by Dickney. And so this transition is really a Stokes type transition. We're going from narrow bands to narrow gaps. The physics here is dominated by these real instantons. The physics here is dominated by these complex instantons. And by changing the tough parameter, we can make a transition from here to here in such a way that it really is a genuine Stokes transition. So I just approach, yeah, just, just to, to clarify completely, the statement is that h bar n in the limit as n goes to infinity and h goes h bar goes to zero. Is this yes? So yes. the the only point of non-analyticity is at the very end of uh, yeah the, the the lowest or the infinite n limit there. Well, I mean yes and no because. That's how you detect the transition, but of course you can look near the transition and now you need to understand all orders of the instanton expansion. And if you come at it from this side, you need to know all orders of the real instantons. And if you come at it from this side, you need to know all orders of the complex instantons. And the transition point is where these uh, complex instantons or real instantons switch to be the dominant ones, just like in the airy function. Uh, I'll give another example of this type of behavior in a matrix model, which is almost identical. And interestingly, even though this has been formulated as a uh, quantum mechanics problem, it's actually in one-to-one -one correspondence with the transition in this uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory, n equals two supersymmetric quantum field theory, studied by Nekrasov and Shavosvili. And it's absolutely a dictionary mapping one-to-one. -one. It's exactly the same problem. And that's why I wrote the energy as U. It's actually a modular parameter in that uh, quantum field theory. So another example, which I think I'll skip over quickly, but just mention for people who know about it already, is a similar phase transition in 2D Yang-Mills theory defined on a sphere, where you can calculate the partition function in two ways. 
One is either through the spectral or Hamiltonian type approach where you sum over representations, is the dimension of the representation. This is the quadratic Casimir, that's like the energy eigenvalue. Or you can think of doing it in the sort of Lagrangian approach where you sum over saddles of the action and these are monopole solutions. And you notice that the coupling or area parameter here is upstairs and here it's on the bottom. And there's a phase transition at a critical area, which in this normalization is pi squared, it's just a normalization issue in the large n limit. And this phase transition is again, it's a, it's a transition between the physics being dominated either by these uh, um, representations coming from the Hamiltonian description or from these monopoles, which are saddles in the Lagrangian description. So that's a similar um, feature in a slightly more sophisticated model than just ordinary quantum mechanics. Another example, which is, illustrates an, a different property again, is the 2D Ising model, which of course is familiar to everybody that there's a phase transition at a certain temperature. What may be less familiar to people is that uh, instead of just talking about the free energy, you can talk about something uh, uh, deeper, which is the correlation function. So imagine the square lattice, to be precise, 2D lattice icing model. Now imagine the correlation between spin at some side and spin at another side. And let's specialize to just diagonal, along the diagonal of the lattice. So S is like the coupling parameter of the inverse temperature. It's actually it's a function of that, but view it as the uh, coupling. So this is a function of the number of steps along the diagonal that you go, and also the coupling. Now, beautiful result from the, the Kyoto school from the early 1980s is that this correlation function satisfies a particular nonlinear equation called the Pendeley 6 equation. And the form of the expansion of this in terms of the coupling was, was the basic structure was found by Jimbo and Miwa. And it's very nice because it, it, there's a sort of simple linearization of this problem, even though it's a very nonlinear problem. You can write it as a determinant where the entries of the determinant are just hypergeometric functions. So there's a way to linearize this problem. The, the difficulty with this large n limit is that the determinant is n by n. And n by n determinants at large n are extremely clumsy objects. Now it was already no long, known long before, back in the 60s, from the work of McQuay and company, that if you consider the double scaling limit where you go a very long distance of this correlator, but you also approach the critical temperature, so this is trying to go to the continuum theory, that this so-called Penlevé 6 nonlinear equation reduces to one of the other Penlevé equations, Penlevé 3. Um, people are probably not all familiar with these Penlevé equations, just think of them as nonlinear versions of all the special functions. So the Penlevé 2 is the nonlinear version of the area equation, Penlevé 3 is the nonlinear version of the Bessel equation, Penlevé 4 is the nonlinear version of the parabolic cylinder equation, Penlevé 5 is the nonlinear version of the confluent hypergeometric, and Penlevé 6 is the nonlinear version of the hypergeometric. So there's a whole hierarchy of these guys, just like there are at the linear level. Now, recently, in the last 10 years or so, there's been spectacular progress, in my, in my opinion, uh, mainly through the work of Lizobi and uh, collaborators. I actually found the all orders expansion of this uh, quantity, and I see here that I use some really terrible notation, I'm sorry. This S is supposed to be this T. And this S is something else. Sorry about that. That's just a bad notation. This is the correlator as a function of this coupling parameter. And it has an instanton expansion where this is the instanton uh, counting parameter. And it's a second order differential equation. So there are two boundary condition parameters. One is this parameter here. And one is, let's call it sigma. And these are some combinatorial factors. The thetas are monodromy factors that are just fixed numbers and some things like a half, but also involving this n here, the number of steps. And these are called the, the uh, conformal block uh, functions. They're given by sums over uh, Young tableau, 
with some known combinatorial factors related to the structure of the, the young tableau and powers of T. So this is an all orders expansion, a trans series in, expansion, in fact, of the solution to the Penler basics equation. And if we apply it to this uh, correlate, it means we can write the full trans series. The interesting point is that it's completely convergent. I've, I've been sort of telling you so far that these resurgent trans series are useful for divergent series, but actually it also applies to convergent series. Now, why is this interesting here? I said that this is basically the sum over all instanton factors. It's going from minus infinity to infinity because these are like e to the i, so you have sines and cosines. And what this means is that if you know these functions here as a function of sigma when n is zero, so that means the zero instanton sector, if you know those functions, and they are known, they are calculated, to include all of the instanton factors, all you need to do is shift this boundary condition parameter by an integer in those functions. It's absolutely spectacular. This is an all orders result uh, due to these people. And the interpretation in terms of resurgence is what I'm explaining here. So this is a, you know, a very sophisticated uh, result that has this clear resurgent interpretation in the sense that there's an infinite number of these saddle points, think of these droplets. But if you know the expansion around the first droplet, then you can immediately write down all of the others. Okay? So that's quite, quite spectacular in my opinion. And the reason this is also of interest is that this is true not just for the Ising model, it's true for all of these pen on A6. And there's an explicit dictionary between these guys and certain integrable models in statistical physics and quantum field theory. And that's what these papers here are about. And they all have this underlying resurgence structure because of this simple relation. Okay, so I think what I'm gonna do now is I had another example um, that I was going to discuss, but I think I, I will skip it and jump on to the question of extrapolation. This is the, a famous unitary matrix model, which has a third order phase transition when the Tuft coupling takes some finite value. It also has this sort of determinant structure but now involving Bessel function instead of hypergeometric functions. And the same story um, can be described. It's related to another one of these Penlevé equations. And the, the one thing I would point out is that there's a sort of order parameter that you can expand in terms of this Tuft coupling and n, n here is now the size of the unitary matrices. And the formal expansion at large n is divergent, but you can write the full trans series completion of this. And if you believe what I'm telling you about resurgence, the large order growth of these coefficients here should be related to the, these coefficients here. But now this is an expansion in one of the n, and the coefficients are not just numbers, they're functions of t. And so I claim that as functions of t, the large order behavior of these are related to these. And indeed it is true. You can study the large order behavior of these and they grow to n factorial. There's a power, which is exactly this function of t, this weird function of t, which you can easily derive from this Penelope equation. And the subleading term, which is going like gamma 2n minus seven halves, is this function of t. And indeed, if you look at the foot low order terms of this expansion, indeed, the next term is exactly this function. So this Barry Howells picture was for a function of one variable. This is an example where you have two parameters. You make an asymptotic expansion at large n, but for any coupling, any TUF coupling, and still this behavior is uh, seen. So that's encouraging because that could easily have failed, which would mean that it would then be useless for studying things like gauge theories where we have multiple parameters that we would like to study asymptotically. So I'm not gonna give all the details of that. Let me go to quickly just talk about extrapolation. <clears throat> 
So this is work with Ovidiu Kostin, who's a uh, pure mathematician, uh, now at Ohio State. Uh, he's an expert in uh, asymptotics and analysis, and he's proven a lot of the actual theorems in the field of resurgence. And we've been working for the last few years on the question of you know, what's this good for, basically. Suppose you take now a really hard problem. To me, a really hard problem is something like QCD, something like 3D Ising model, something where you have limited options of what you can actually calculate. And maybe all you can calculate are five terms, 10 terms of some expansion somewhere. Large parameter, small parameter, but some region. Maybe that's all you can do. So then the question is, does resurgence help you to do something? with that limited information. Because if you take resurgence seriously, it says, if you know something about the expansion around one critical point, in principle, that encodes information about expansions at other critical points. But then the question is, do you need all the information? Can you actually get information about another critical point from just a limited amount of information about another critical point? And the answer is really surprising. So we did a high precision test for one of these uh, uh, nonlinear differential equations. They show up very often in, in physics. And we did that for two reasons. One is um, it's easy to generate expansions. The more precise reason is that a lot is known about their analytic structure, so we can test throughout the complex plane and we can get uh, precision estimates. And uh, since then, we've actually worked out why this is working and uh, there'll be a paper coming out soon about the, the mathematics underlying this, which is quite rich. So let me just mention, this is the nonlinear Fenlebe one equation. It's the, if in some sense, the simplest of these nonlinear equations, but in other senses, it's the most complicated. It doesn't have any other parameters. The other Fenlebe equations have external parameters, which lead to extra structure. This one doesn't. So if you look at this equation, second derivative, second power, just some function of x, this is a conventional normalization. Now, if you think of large x, large positive x, we can choose a solution where it's smooth, so this goes to zero, and this has to balance this, so the leading behavior is root x over six, plus or minus. And then it's easy to show that at large x, the expansion around this goes in powers of x to the five fourths. And it's easy to plug this into here and get recursion formulas for the coefficients to generate what I would call perturbative data. Okay, so these are just numbers, input numbers. And this defines a particular solution to panel of one called a three truncate solution for the reasons I'll explain in a minute. And so I'm gonna take this I'm going to work just with these numbers. So somebody walks into my office and just gives me a list of numbers. And I want to ask from just those numbers, what can I tell you about how this solution behaves not near x equals infinity, but near x equals zero and x near x equals plus i infinity all over the place in the complex plane. Okay, how much information, how, may, how big does n have to be to me, for me to get useful information? So what's known about the, these are basically 100 years old. It's essentially exactly 100 years that Penave and company were studying um, these equations. There was a big uh, uh, movement back then in the, in the, mainly in the French mathematical community. This equation has a lot of interesting structure in the complex x-plane. It has a built-in five-fold symmetry. If you rescale x by a root of the fifth root of unity and rescale the function by that thing squared, it's invariant. So it has this basic five-fold structure. Moreover, this is what's called an anti-Stokes line. So you have oscillatory exponential behavior, decaying and growing exponential behavior, oscillatory, oscillatory, decaying and growing. And there's this shaded region here where the behavior of the function is completely different from how it is in the rest of the complex plane. And so the question I wanna ask here is, Suppose I have this limited information derived here at large x goes to plus infinity. Can I learn about how this function behaves as I go around in the complex plane? So first, how much can I learn as I go down near zero? 
And can I learn what happens at a Stokes transition, anti-Stokes transition? And the, the, the answer, at least to me and also to a video, it was completely surprising. And the most interesting directions are these Stokes lines. They're, that's where these phase transitions occur and different uh, saddles dominate the behavior. So if you just do the first thing of starting at infinity and going along the real axis towards zero, there's a question of how accurately can you get the value at zero? And so if you permit me 50 terms of the expansion at infinity, and I can generate them in a nanosecond with one line of Mathematica, you can get 65 digit precision at the origin. So I can compute the function that's first derivative and second derivative and check how accurately the equation is satisfied. Now this equation is very famous and so serious numerical analysis people use this as a test of their favorite algorithms. And the best they do is basically machine precision, 10 to the minus 15, 10 to the minus 16. And yet with this completely trivial operation, we can get 65 digits without struggling. If you only give me 10 times of the expansion at infinity, the precision is basically 10 to the minus 25. So this begs the question, why? Why is it so much better? And the reason is you can develop these extrapolation methods that keep some of this global information built into the structure of the extrapolation. So that's just going along the real axis. It's actually more dramatic if you start trying to go into this shaded region here, this uh, so-called pole region. So Boutrou realized, he was the one who showed this five-fold symmetry, realized that there was this region here where the function develops poles, and only poles, no branch cuts, just poles. Whereas here, there are no poles in any of these regions here. And there's a conjecture due to de Broven that in fact, all of the poles are restricted to this two pi over five wedge. And that was proved by Costin and company in 2012. So a reasonable question is, okay, you give me 10 terms of the expansion here, from that information, can I learn anything about this completely different region here? And again, the, the answer is uh, it's quite amazing. There are these anti-Stokes transitions at four pi over five. And if you just give me 10 terms of the expansion in infinity, I end up with these blue dots here, which are the pole first hint of poles in this region, no other poles anywhere else. If you allow me 50 terms in the expansion in infinity, I get the red dots. And the red dots are indistinguishable from the exact uh, calculations, which again are um, sort of frontier level numerical analysis problems. So this is really amazing. We've managed to go across one and two Stokes transitions with limited information at infinity and keep enough Somehow that limited set of coefficients encodes enough information that we can go into this completely different whole region. Now, another way of looking at this is, remember that we started with, sorry about this, we started with this sort of asymptotic series in this weird power of X. Inside this pole region, the natural description of the function looks like this. There's a double pole, Around any one of these poles, you expand the function like this, the location of the pole. The next term vanishes, the next term vanishes, the next term vanishes, the next term that is non-zero is quadratic, and the coefficient is this pole value divided by 10. The next term is the cube, and the coefficient is 1 sixth. And the next term gives you the other boundary condition parameter. And from then on, all of the terms are determined in terms of these two boundary condition parameters around any pole. That's, that follows from the, and this was known to Boutreau uh, 100 years ago, that follows from the structure of the differential equation. The question is, how do you evaluate? How do you find where this pole is? And how do you determine this second boundary condition parameter? These are exponentially sensitive problems. So what we can do is we can take our solution that was generated out here, we do our extrapolation techniques using these ideas of resurgence, and we push it into this region here, extrapolate it across these two Stokes transitions, and then we re-expand it. So we find this pole, 
And then we just re-expand the function. And we discover this is the answer. So this should be one, it's one to 30 something digits. The next term should be zero, not zero to 35 digits. The next term should be zero, it's also zero to 30 something digits. The next coefficient should be the location of the pole divided by 10, and it is. The location of the pole is minus 2.38, blah, blah, blah. The next term should be, coefficient should be one sixth, which it is to 30 something digits. The next term should be this next parameter, which in the literature was known to maybe 10 decimal places, but here we have 30 something decimal places. The next term should be zero, was zero to 30 digits. And the next term should be the pole value squared divided by 300. So this thing here squared divided by 300, and this agrees to 30 digits. Okay, so it's really quite remarkable that starting from this perturbative information with only, in that case, 50 terms, we can actually reconstruct a completely different analytic structure of the solution. So this trans series that I started with goes through this transition, this metamorphosis, goes through another one as you cross this second uh, Stokes line, ends up looking completely different. So think of this back in, in terms of the Matthew equation, this periodic potential, the expression for the energy in the band region is completely different from the expression of the energy in the gap region. In one case, we use the tight binding model. In the other region, we use the free electron model. So even the degrees of freedom we use to describe the problem are completely different. And here, this example is showing by analogy, in this case, we start with one of these types of expansions. And if we do the extrapolation in this way that's built on, the, on, on resurgence, it somehow encodes the information in such a way that we can recover and reconstruct to extremely high precision the other form of the expansion elsewhere in the complex plane. Okay, now I see I've gone over time. So we now understand why this is working. Um, so I won't belabor the point since I'm, I'm over time, but I can answer questions about that if people want. Let me just go to the conclusions. Sorry about going over. That's okay, we're not strict with time in that sense. Okay, um, so I think now, there's a lot of information just being thrown at you. So let me just say that I think the, the main message is that there is a formalism called resurgent asymptotics, which has the hope of being able to unify perturbative and non-perturbative analysis through these so-called trans series. And there's a hope that it can actually encode truly global information about some physical quantity we might be calculating and extrapolate it from some region where we don't really see any sign of these features into some region where we are interested. And the transitions from these different regions are these uh, really examples of the Stokes phenomenon of interchange of saddles. And all of this is completely proven for finite dimensional differential equations of any order, nonlinear and linear, also difference equations and integral equations. And at the moment, there are what I would call not really mathematical proofs, but lots of circumstantial evidence and explicit examples in the realm of quantum mechanics, matrix models, some quantum field theories. Um, chern simons theory is a particularly interesting quantum field theory where it's very rich and very explicit. And some examples in topological string theory. And I should at least mention that there's a, a, a set of people working on actually implementing these ideas on the lattice who have been able to solve problems such as the phase transition in the uh, um, Turing model, which is a, a non-trivial quantum field theory, and there are some results about Hubbard models also. Um, it's early days, so we don't know how far this is going to go, but it's at least uh, passed some tests that it could easily have failed. There's no proof that this structure should uh, continue to the infinite dimensional world, but uh, the uh, promising signs that it may be able to. And the last message is this idea of extrapolation, that somehow it really does seem to be true that some of this non-perturbative information is somehow hidden in perturbative data. You just have to know how to decode it. And uh, again, 
that's potentially very useful in many physics applications. So let, let me stop there. Happy to take questions. Well, th thank you for a, a superb talk. And, uh, I'm, sure, Sorry, I'm not sure there'll be any questions. You were so clear. So. <laughs> yes, please. I have a question. Charles. Go ahead, Charles. Hello. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah, I can hear. Can hear. Yeah, I have two questions. One is, um, can you give some idea what sort of function or class of functions do not have trans series uh, yeah. expansion? Yeah. And secondly, so is, mm -hmm. um, yes. secondly, can you give us an example of functions which are well behaved and don't, in a sense, need trans series expansions, but nevertheless can be have their perturbative expansions improved by using them? Yeah, so there, there's a, okay, there's a two very, very good questions. The, let me give you the obscure answer to the first question. Um, what the pure mathematicians have proven is that there's a class of what they call analyzable functions, not analytic functions, but analyzable functions, which are defined as being built out of these iterations of uh, powers of some parameter, iterated exponentials, and iterated logarithms and powers thereof. And it's proven that these functions built in that way, so-called trans series, are closed under essentially all mathematical operations of analysis. So analytic continuation, Borel summation, inversion, integration, differentiation, essentially any operation you can think of, it's proven that this is a closed language. Now, what does that mean for physics? It's subsequently be pro being proven that if you try to do, if you try to solve some nonlinear differential equation, for example, you can solve that nonlinear differential equation within that class of functions. Okay. So, in, in a sense, that defines a set of problems. Now, what does that mean? Um, What's not clear here is whether this applies to say an infinite dimensional set of uh, differential equations. There's a concept in the, in the mathematics literature of, of what they call a natural problem, which I think is a bit of a cop out, but uh, nevertheless, which is that if the function you are trying to find satisfies some set of equations, then it's a natural problem. If you just make up a series with some ridiculous rule for the coefficients, that would not be a natural problem. So you can construct for me a uh, series where the coefficients are, you know, e to the one over n to the three sevens times exponential of blah, blah, blah. You could just make up some series and that's not guaranteed to be within this class. But if you generate your function from some well-defined set of differential equations, integral equations, difference equations, then it will fall within this class. So that's, that's one answer. Um, your second question was, please remind me. For functions which do have convergent expansions and were well behaved, how can yeah. one improve? What, what sort of um, intuition can get one get about that? Yeah, so the, the, there are two ways to in, interpret the word improve. Um, so for example, think of the Bessel functions, right? They have an infinite radius of convergence. Right. But they're completely useless if the, the variable is you know, three. If the variable is three, you're much better off using an asymptotic expansion from infinity in terms of precision. So there are things like that. There are all sorts of techniques for accelerating convergence, for example. And so one of the ideas here is that you can uh, adapt these acceleration methods so that they are working not just along the real axis, for example, but also in the complex plane. And that requires the introduction of some ideas from uh, resurgence to sort of preserve analytic structure as you uh, analytically continue and to allow for the appearance of, for example, Stokes transitions. So this is very, very different from the philosophy in a lot of mathematical physics books, where you know, if, you, if you read something like uh, Morse and Feshbach about asymptotic series, you know, they're, they're really skeptical. They, it's almost as if these exponential terms are unknowable and sort of let's not talk about them. What this is saying is that often you have information which you can use to 
narrow down and in some cases precisely define what is the structure of those exponentially small terms. And then you can build that into your expansion and that will improve the realm of extrapolation. Now, why might you want to do this? You might want to do this for the Li Yang reason, that one way to find phase transitions in statistical model systems is to look for complex zeros of a partition function. And in, the, in a uh, thermodynamic limit or an infinite n limit, the Li Yang perspective is that these complex zeros, which must be complex at finite n, in the large uh, or thermodynamic limit, these will somehow pinch the real axis at the location of the actual phase transition. So in order to address those sorts of questions, you really need to be able to go off the uh, real axis mm -hmm. in some controllable way. So have they been so used yet <coughs> to improve the asymptotic series which already exist for the Bessel function? Or can you pass on to the hypergeometric differential? Yeah, so, so in fact, if you read now, if you look at the Digital Library of Mathematical Functions, this uh, big project of Olver and company, mm -hmm. they've now modified all the asymptotic expansion descriptions. There's a new chapter, in fact, about this stuff, mm -hmm. which is, goes under the name of exponential asymptotics, that you can really improve the, the asymptotic expansions to include all of these exponential terms. Mm -hmm. From a mathematical point of view, you know, do you really need exponential accuracy? I, that's, that's a question of perspective. But my perspective on that would be that these exponentials aren't just about precision. In physics, they're about physics. I mean, these instantons are physical. They, they're mm -hmm. telling us something about tunneling. And these are, these are real objects and these Stokes transitions and these extra terms in the trend series are genuine physical objects that we should understand. It's not just about getting precision. Sure. It's about yeah. understanding some of, the, some of the physics that's going on. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you take it from the point of view of, of people um, just purely mathematically looking at these solutions to differential equations, there's also a question of precision. And in principle, if you have all of these exponential terms, you have essentially infinite precision. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Brian, you have a question, Brian? Um, when, when you were discussing the, um, the perturbative um, expansion on the poles, was it the Panlevy one you had, that five-fold yes, yeah, diagram? Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. In, in, in the wedge, um, I think you had four blue poles and 15 red ones. Yeah, so, there are, so part of the last step of this analysis is a Pade expansion. And so the number of poles accessible is half the number of terms you give me at the beginning. And right. another, I was going to ask, is there a correlation yeah. between the amount of information on the two sides? I mean, you need yes, three yes, pieces yes, of information sure, to define sure. a pole. So uh, you need 15 numbers for those, you, you need 45 numbers for those red poles. Yeah, so, but you gave me 50, pole, 50 numbers. Yeah, yeah, so, so I was wondering, so, I mean, is that a direct correlation? Yeah. Yeah, so in fact, in this more recent paper with a video, we, we, we've actually explained why this is the case and we can actually tell you um, how many coefficients you need to be able to achieve a certain precision and to be able to go a certain distance in the complex plane. So as a function of the number of terms. So here, this was sort of an, an exploratory uh, 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 investigation, but uh, a paper from uh, earlier this year explains why this works and gives really explicit bounds on the level of improvement as a function of n that you can achieve by doing different types of extrapolation procedures. And, and the, the bottom line is really dramatic. From exactly the same numbers, you can process them in different ways and you can achieve completely different levels of precision. For example, if you give me 10 terms of an asymptotic expansion, then the usual story with asymptotic expansions is you believe that at a certain point, you keep giving me more numbers and the answer gets worse. That, that's what we unfortunately teach our students. This is complete nonsense. The only reason that is true is that if you try to represent the function by that truncated series, but that's the dumbest thing you can do. What you should do, and you can prove that it's better, is that you should make, say, a Pade approximant of that truncated series. 
And you can quantify that that now improves as it increases. But then you can show that if you first go to the Borel plane and then do your Pade analysis in the Borel plane, it increases the level of precision by an extra factor of one over n. Okay, so if n is 10, you know, that's, that's interesting. But then you can show that if you do this, these conformal mapping tricks that come out from the uh, resurgent approach, you get an extra factor of one over n squared. So what it means is that if you give me 10 terms of an expansion, there are these sort of three or four different types of recipes for extrapolating. And you can actually quantify how much further you can push the expansion down to say small x if you start at x equals infinity. And you can really show why it works. And it's, uh, and it's dramatic. And so nobody in their right mind should be using just truncated asymptotic expansions. And nobody in their right mind should be using Pade analysis in the x-plane rather than in the Borel plane. It's just manifestly worse. So, yeah. um, so that to some level, we can quantify this. But uh, it's still early days. Uh Bernard Marianne. Oh, sorry. Were you finished, Brian? I have some questions also. Yeah. yeah I, I, sorry, but Bernard and Marianne were next, and then you were on after yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. I, I agree that the results are really spectacular. I have two questions. One is I easily can imagine, as you said earlier uh, in the early stages of the talk, that uh, from asymptotic behavior near one singularity, uh, you can get uh, the low order behavior yes. uh, at another yeah. singularity. Yeah. But what, what I have difficulties to understand, what's the reason that from low order behavior at one, uh, uh, let's say, per, a perturbative uh, mm. point, uh, you get the low order beha behavior. Yes, so, yeah. Yeah. so this is an excellent question. So, this, let's see, can I go back? Uh, sorry, if you would permit me for a second to go back. All right, so this sort of behavior here that I would call this generic Dingle, Berry, Howells type behavior, which relates the large order behavior at some singularity to the low order behavior at some other, can be understood at a very trivial level if you go to the Burrell plane. It's really the old result that the reason, now that you're talking about a Borel transform, it has a finite radius of convergence. And we all know that the radius of convergence is set by the location of the nearest singularity. Okay? Yeah. But you can push that a bit further. You can say that if you study even more closely the expansion around the, one of the critical points, more detailed information about that can tell you not just the location of the nearest singularity, it can tell you the behavior near the nearest singularity. This is called Dobos theory. Mm -hmm. So that's somehow the origin of this type of structure. The surprising thing is that then you can go to results like this, where that is true, but something deeper is true. Here in this formula that relates the fluctuations around the let's call it the, the one instant time, any order of that expansion is related to any order of this expansion. So if you know these, if you know the first 10 terms of this guy, you automatically know the first 10 terms of this guy. So there's a, there's a deeper type of resurgence here. That's not just this generic large order, low order behavior. But there's an explicit relation. And this, in this case, this is less well understood how general these sorts of features are. But you know, this is an example coming from quantum mechanics. So you know, honestly, it is just a differential equation, but you can interpret this in terms of a path integral. You can also derive the spectrum from a path integral representation of the resolvent. And in that interpretation, this really is a relation between the expansion around one saddle and another to all orders. So at this level, we're really talking about uh, examples where this behavior happens. The full generality of that, I think is, it's safe to say it's not understood um, at this level, 
but the, the general result from the um, research in asymptotics literature for differential equations and whatever says that such relations either must be or should be, depending on your, how seriously you take it, uh, be present. My second question is, for the, you, you always wrote down instantons, mm -hmm. but uh, more difficult perhaps are uh, the, the renormalons. Yes. But yes. Uh, from the mathematical structure, they, they should not be so different. Yes, yes. So some things are known. Um, in fact, there are, there's a fair bit of activity at the moment about renormalons. So for people who are not experts in this, um, when you do quantum mechanics, the reason, the underlying reason that perturbation theory is generically divergent is just a combinatorial reason that when you make a perturbative expansion, the number of diagrams essentially grows factorially. So unless there's some magic floating around, the complexity of your problem grows factorial and it will generically be divergent. So the same thing happens in quantum field theory and that combinatorial type divergence is associated with what we call instantons. But it turns out in certain quantum field theories, there, there's another source of divergence, which goes by the name of renormalons. And these are related not just to combinatorics, but to actual phase-based behavior of certain classes of diagrams. And what typically happens is that these lead to a faster um, rate of divergence. So in some sense, they're more important than the instant times. That's generically the case. And in, in those theories, we know a lot about what, where the, what the Renormalon uh, singularity structure should be in the Viral plane. And we're starting to learn things about how this relates to resurgence, um, but it's not completely un understood yet. Um, but you're right that this should be, um, it can be formulated and approached in, in the language of resurgence. So, I don't. Thank you. Um, so there's, I wrote a paper recently specifically on this topic. There are certain classes of quantum field theories where using this uh, chroma con hopf alger approach to renormalization, you can reformulate um, the perturbative expansion of the, say, an anomalous dimension or a beta function in terms of a particular nonlinear differential equation. And now you can show that since it's a nonlinear differential equation, you can apply all of this resurgence analysis quite straightforwardly. And you can identify this with renormalon type behavior in the original quantum field theory. So that's one possible approach. Um, but Which paper? Uh, it was a paper of a month ago or so with uh, okay. Michael, Michael Berinsky. Um, there's also a very nice paper, I think last year by Marcos Mourinho about this. Uh, on renormalons where you can do things very explicitly in 2D integrable models. There you have, because of integrability and because of 2D, there's a lot more um, machinery you can use to analyze the quantum field theory compared to, for example, in Yang Mills or QCD. Thank you. Hello, can I ask a question? Yeah, please yeah. go ahead, Bal. Okay. First, it was a very beautiful talk. I liked very much. The first issue is analyzable functions need not be anal analytic functions. No, need not right. be. Yeah, it's, so it's a much much larger class. No, but you are using analytic attenuation in many of your calculations. Right, but that's the idea. That uh, if if you work with trans series, the, the basic philosophy is that you can apply all of your favorite complex analysis tricks to trans series. But they are Whereas, not analytic. I mean, you doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's the point. That's the that's the point of adding these other terms into the trend series is that they make them analyzable in the sense that you can you can control things like monodromy and analytic continuation, but they're not analytic functions. Yeah. Hmm. The name is analyzable. Hmm. Another question is there are cases, for example, in QED, there is yes. an old set of Dyson, yes. 
the expansion in e squared is asymptotic okay? or yeah. old conjecture. Okay? Yes. Now, yes. there is an instant on in QED. Sorry, so, I can't, I didn't hear, sorry. There is no instant on in QED. Okay? Right. So, in that case, what does anyone do? Go into complex e squared then find an instant on? Well, I, so I'm using instant on in, in the sense of uh, non perturbative contribution. So, in the, in the QED case, Dyson's argument was that uh, if you imagine calculating some quantity like g minus 2, it should just be a function of alpha, call it e squared, then if that expansion were convergent, that would mean that there's some non-zero radius of convergence inside of which you can essentially freely analytically continue anywhere you want within that uh, region. And then his physical argument was that that can't possibly be true because if E squared is negative and you try to build a uh, quantum vacuum for QED on, on a world where E squared is negative so that like charge is now attract, it cannot, this is the physical argument, be continuously related to the physical vacuum where E squared is positive. So there's this idea that uh, in that sense, the divergence is caused by the instability, which occurs when you analytically continue E squared to minus. So a simpler example of the same thing would be the um, anharmonic oscillator. So take a potential which is X squared plus lambda times X to the fourth. Okay, so if lambda is positive, then the potential just, you know, it's just a bounded, increasing potential. You can do perturbation theory there. It turns out to be divergent. So why is it divergent? Well, you apply Dyson's argument. You change lambda to minus lambda, and now the potential looks like that. It's going down. So for example, the ground state is now metastable. So you completely expect there to be an imaginary part, which should be exponentially small for the ground state energy, corresponding to the fact that it's a metastable state. It can tunnel out. So if you ask yourself, how can you generate such an imaginary exponentially small term from the original perturbative expansion when lambda was positive, now we're in exactly Dyson's argument. Okay? And that's the argument of how, why the perturbative expansion there in the enharmonic oscillator must be divergent. Right? So, so there's, there's no proof in Dyson's paper. It's extremely beautiful. It's extremely powerful. But it, in the end, it's a physics argument. It's almost certainly correct. But uh, I should, uh, you know, we should remember that uh, many people have tried to prove that structure in QED. And so far, nobody's been able to without resorting to some physical argument. Okay. Can I ask, I mean, uh, from what I understand, there is a mapping from anal analyzable functions to anal analytic, fun analytic functions. Not a mapping. I mean, analytic is just a simple example of analyzable. You know, there are simple functions, right? Yeah. Z, but, that's a simple function. It's analytic, right? But mm -hmm. there are more complicated functions when you get to complicated nonlinear problems. And, but, but you uh, did state, uh, Gerald, that, uh, the, that analyzable functions are closed under analytic continuation. Sure. Well, so is Z. It's just a particularly simple version of an analyzable function. But if there is analytic continuation, it has to be an analytic function. No, no, that's the point. And it, it's a subtle point, but that is the point. I, okay, I don't fully okay. understand. Yeah, no, it's, I don't, don't uh, th this is complicated and, and this is subtle. Yeah. I, I think what you're saying is that it takes you to a different analytic function if you've got one, or it takes you to a different function, which is, the analytic continuation in some natural sense of this function. Is that what it is? No, I mean, I think most of us would say that things like e to the minus one over z is non-analytic. It's an essential singularity. The point is you can build trans series using these elements of powers of z, powers of e to the minus one over z and log z. You can build objects which are some sort of at the simplest level, triple sums over these things, 
you can build objects that behave well under analytic continuation. Whereas if you restrict to just one portion of that quantity, namely just the Taylor series part, the perturbative part, it clearly does not encode the full analytic structure continuation structure. Okay. Can I ask, uh, really, I stop very quickly, but the, the T that you're writing, look, it is a one, one flag determinant. That is the language people know square root of that. Okay. That, sure, the, sure. But that's just the prefect. That's the Gaussian prefect. That is the one yes. for which you, there were remarkable identities which you... Yes, yes. Before. Okay. Yeah, but the point here is to be able to go beyond that. that that's that sort of the truth. That's the traditional yeah. semi-classical approximation. That looks very much like the determinant of that object, square root of a determinant of some elliptic operator, and reminds one, let us say, of heat kernel expansions. Is sure. Relation? Yes. Yeah. I mean, heat kernel expansions are generically divergent. You can upgrade them to trans series. In certain cases, you can actually do all these calculations explicitly. Hmm. Um, Has somebody uh, upgraded some of the heat kernel expansions to? Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a paper. This... I, I'm trying to remember who it was, but I, th I think Chris Howells has a paper about. Maybe also with Michael Berry about um, heat kernel expansions. There was some paper by Konsevich. On... Yeah, so uh, Konsevich has been working very hard on this problem for for years. He's giving a seminar next week, actually, about it. Um, so their perspective is, is really quite beautiful, is that if you think back to this area example, as you change this parameter and different steepest descent contours contribute or not to the actual function, you can formulate that structure in terms of uh, um, cohomology of uh, curves. And then if you think in that, in those terms, if you tried to write one of these sum over thimble type expansions of an infinite dimensional problem, for example, even in quantum mechanics, you know, these thimbles, you can think of them somehow in terms of infinite dimensional cohomology. And, you know, that's a very rich approach in, in mathematical terms and you know, they're making progress about uh, being able to maybe prove within certain classes of, of path integrals that there really is resurgent structure. Whereas the examples I talked about were really calculations of explicit examples where you just calculate and see what happens rather than some, I think more say, deeper understanding of why it's working when it's working. I, I don't think that aspect is, is understood uh, so far. When you um, so so they, had a, they had a paper maybe last month or something, uh, Konsevich and Soberman, about this. Um, hmm. Where is he giving the seminar? Well, <laughs> where is an interesting question. I don't know where he is, <laughs> but it, it, it'll be oh. in uh, Denmark. Uh, hosted from uh, Odense. Okay. So. This is related also to this distrema Heckman theorems, no? Localization. Yes, of course. So, so one way to look at distrema Heckman is these are examples where you can really make rigorous these uh, sums over saddles. So, in some point, in some sense, they're both very interesting, very uninteresting. Un they're very interesting because you can calculate and you see the full structure, but they're somewhat deceptive in the sense that they're so special that uh, you, lose, you lose some of the extra structure because a lot of these expansions truncate. And so the simplest example I, th I think we can think of is again, these Bessel functions where if you look at the large x expansion of a Bessel function, you know they have exponentials and then they're multiplied by infinite series, which are asymptotic. In these localizable examples, the parameters are such that that multiplying asymptotic series truncates. Okay. 
So that's nice because you know you know everything about it and whatever, but you lose one level of information. Um, so the, the nice physics analog of this is supersymmetric quantum mechanics, where you know I, I was trying to argue that uh, from a perturbative expansion you can generate information about non-perturbative physics. So now you you ask me about. Uh, or you should ask me about supersymmetric quantum mechanics where the ground state energy is zero to all of this. So the perturbative expansion of ground state energy is zero plus zero plus zero plus, which is zero. So the question is how on earth does that encode information about um, non-perturbative physics beyond that, about supersymmetry breaking, for example? And the answer is you can add a small parameter which breaks the supersymmetry softly. And then you see all of this asymptotic resurgent structure. But when you tune this uh, supersymmetry breaking parameter to its say integer value, the prefactor of those exponential of those asymptotic expansions vanishes and everything truncates. So it's sort of hidden there, but if you choose these non-generic values, you don't see it. So that, that's, in a sense, what is happening in these localizable theories. Um, Sorry, Werner, did you have another question? Yes, uh, yes. Um, it's, it's a pity that uh, you're not in, in Dublin. Otherwise, I would have preferred to ask this question private. But sure, um, no anyhow. Well, Denjo can press the stop record button. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, OK, so one thing you need. Uh, in, in front of uh, the instanton terms, for example, is some determinant, uh, for yes. example, uh, the determinant of, uh, of a Laplacian on some yes. arbitrary yes. Riemann surface. Yes. yes. So um, uh, do you have, have some insight or some, some reference? Uh, I, I know for a torus, you basically get, get the eta function. But yes. for example, I, I don't know uh, what uh, uh, is known about uh, the higher genus case. Yeah, so the higher genus cases are more complicated. So there's a class of problems that can be solved, and but they're still special. You know, they're they're hyperelliptic, but special hyperelliptic in the sense that there's some symmetry, and there's a series of um, papers explaining how these work. Um, um, it's really motivated by this Nekrasov shed. It's really formalism for integral models, which you can then backtrack to quantum mechanics. And uh, there are a lot of results there. I can send you some references if, if you want. It's a pretty big literature, actually. Yeah. But for the, for the completely general, you know, higher genus case, this is, of course, a very, very complicated problem. And it, it's only, to my knowledge, it's only possible to write some formal type expressions at, at this point. Yeah. But the examples that have been done in these sort of integrable type cases, you know, it, it works beautifully. Um, there's a lot of deep number theory and uh, algebraic geometry underlying calculating these determinants and the fluctuations around them. Um, Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll send you an email. Yeah, that's fine. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Well, I must not be dominating. But there is some, when you cross these um, uh, saddle points, not because of the square root, there is something called the Maslow index. Yes. Yes. Where is this in your calculations? Okay. Yeah, so it's the same place it was before. I mean, th this is, I think, what you call well understood through the work of Goodsfiller and company. Mm. Um, I have nothing more to add beyond that. That's just part of the phase factor in this thimble decomposition. Okay. So that's, uh, that's in some sense, the beginning of the story. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely important part of the story, but it's, uh, I don't think there's anything new um, that the resurgent perspective adds to that feature, yeah. in my opinion. Thanks. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Gerald again for a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you.